All right. Well, thank you. Well, thanks, everybody. I know we're going to have folks wandering back in as they do their bathroom break and grab some coffee and all that good stuff. But, you know, it's nice to be here this morning and this afternoon. And I'm around here all, all day tomorrow, too. And then Saturday. Saturday is when we get into the real details on all the things of how to be safe and go through the Z. And that's, uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. This afternoon is going to be kind of an unusual talk for me. When you go to conferences, you always ask, well, what do they want? And, you know, a lot of them want to hear, well, let's, let's go over the big fatal incidences. And I do that a lot. I, many of you may know I kind of keep a lot of those numbers. And, and that's important to be able to look at that and say, well, what is killing us? And we'll have some time on Saturday to go over those things and, and other details as well, the, the first aid and such. Uh, but, you know, I don't get asked enough, well, what about all the things that are reportables? What about the bulk of things that happen to us that result in lost days, but not fatalities? And anyone here that deals with worker comp claims know it's all those injuries that add up in lost days that really build your rate. And so, you know, they, they said, well, we'd like to hear about a couple of these. So like I say, it's, it's kind of fun for me. Hopefully it'll be for you as entertaining as well as informative. And we're gonna take a look at really just three, the hazards involved with pesticide applications, poisonous plants, and then drugs. And I'll finish up with that one. It's kind of an important one. And uh, what was kind of coincidental is this morning, when I flipped on the news, they were even talking about that. It's kind of a, a big issue everywhere. So hopefully you, you find this informative and interesting and uh, let's get her going here. Well, as I mentioned, the big one is always what happened in terms of what killed people. Those are important questions. You know, we wanna make sure that are we design climbing systems and procedures that obviously result in fewer fatalities. I don't know how many read TCI Magazine in the accident briefs. How many read TCI Magazine? Uh, I mean, there's no paywall, so why not? And the most popular column in there is their accident brief section that they have. Now, they've kind of taken away the calendar, which was a little morbid. But what you could do is every month you can open it up, and here's a calendar, and they show everybody that died doing tree work. Now, what's kind of crazy is when I open up the Chronicles of Higher Education, they don't have a calendar showing where the profs die. You know, it's kind of bad that we have an industry that you literally can go through and look and say, oh, yep, there, 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 there. And they've kind of gotten away from that, but they have great information in there. I will remind people, as they will, that it's not a scientific sampling. It's just reports they pick up. But it's very enlightening and quite often it follows trends as well. So when you start going in and you read, oh, this one and this one, this one, by the way, try to find an issue without electrical contact. You won't. Uh, that's always one of the big ones as well as some of the others. Uh, I like this uh, remark from Shigo. Trees are large, heavy objects that'll kill you if they fall on you. And you know, when we start looking at fatalities, uh, tree felling and climbing are the real big ones out there, no pun intended. Uh, we've done some weight studies with trees on our campus, for example, and if you take, a, for us, an oak, an, excuse me, an elm, an American elm, two to two and a half feet in diameter, 65 feet tall, that tree weighs about 22,000 pounds, green, the second we cut it down. That tree has 150,000 leaves. The leaves weigh about 300 pounds. You know, people say, well, I'm, I'm pruning the tree to the weight. Well, cut out the trunk. You know, just leave the branches there. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier today, and I'll go on to it more on Saturday too, is just that falls are kind of our biggest system now. Um, I hate to say it, I'm an old school climber. Not that that's a bad thing, but I, the only way I get up trees now is all the new technology. But I don't know about you, but I shudder every time there's a recall, uh, one of our, our climbing tools now. And it's kind of like, oh yeah, well, you know, taunt line hitches didn't fail if you tied them right. Uh, where we've got a lot of tools that we still have to be real careful with. Now, by the way, I like them all, don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, I'll also mention that falls are our biggest non-fatal hospitalization. 
As a trivia point, guess what you break when you fall from a tree? You, one of two things you break. For the most, you can break anything, but one of two things. Well, no, not your back. That's a good one, though, but not, not your back. It's sometimes, but the two big ones. Well, it's your ankles, tibias in there. You know what happens? It's a Don Juan fall. You land on your feet, and you keep breaking it. The other one you don't think about until you start going through it, femurs. It's hard to break a femur, and it can be fatal if you break a femur. How the heck do you break a femur when you fall out of a tree? This is easy, people, for all you climbers. Now, because you don't fall straight to the ground. You bounce as you're going through. Yeah, I know you're cringing because you climb, and you can envision that now, but seriously, that's what happens. You know, you fall 30 feet and land sideways on a branch and bounce off that. Yeah, you'll break a femur. Well, that 1% are the fatal of the um, incidences. 5% are what we have for the hospitalizations. Hospitalizations, it's an overnight, and it might just be one night or several. But look at that, 94% is really today's presentation. And these are the ones that you have to show up at the emergency department, and they're going to take, take care of you there and release you. Or it might be ones that you can deal with on site, but they're still reportables. In other words, things that you are supposed to report, things that you are supposed to keep track of. And that's the bulk of all our incidents, as it would be for any profession. And we're going to focus on just a little bit of that. If you take a look, it's the back injuries. Strains and sprains, that really gets us. Uh, you know what, you can trip and fall on lots of things on our job sites. Uh, minor burns and lacerations, because if they're major, you're hospitalized. And we're going to focus on that little sliver up there. Poisoning. You might even like poisoning. We even have those? Yeah, we do. So today you're going to hear about that little piece of the pie. And we'll start out with pesticide poisoning. Now, that's a real little sliver of that. It's not a real major one. And by major, that we have a lot of them. In there, you know, one state, they tracked a few, most of them were the organophosphates. Uh, but if you take a look at landscape and tree care workers, you know, you're, you're doing lawn care too, obviously, and you're too. We do track them and we do have them across the country. Uh, the biggest thing, if you take a look nationwide for everybody, pesticides are down in there at about 6% of our calls to poison control. And we do have about 27 deaths. So 27 deaths, it's, like I say, it's not one of the things we talk about regarding fatalities. It's mostly minor poisonings. And obviously most of these occur to homeowners. And the biggest group, of course, are kids. You know, you don't lock your cabinets. And everybody here that had kids know you lock everything. They can break into anything they want. And they'll eat anything they can get their hands on. And so a lot of our poisonings, in fact, plant poisonings tend to be with small children. Well, and the other thing I do want to point out, but not spend a lot of time on, because that's not the heart of this presentation, is we're talking about poisonings that are reportables. You got ill. We're not talking about cancer risks today. We're not talking about long-term impacts of applying pesticides. The good news is, you're not that different from the general population. The bad news is you are in a couple. And the one I want you to note is bladder cancer it is a fairly high one for the group of pesticide applicators. That includes everybody. That includes ag. And you're only a small portion of that. And we do have some cancers, as pointed out there, that we do see an increase in as well. But fortunately, you're in kind of a small group for that. But let's look at how we apply pesticides. That was fun. <laughs> uh, anyone remember those? Anyone still got one? Good luck going down the street in one of these these days. That's Michigan back in the 70s. We used to go down the streets and spray everything. It was amazing. I loved them. Uh, I mean, there's a little earlier going through Green Bay. Imagine doing that today. Even mosquitoes, people would get upset with you. But you would spray these things, and my God, did that stuff work. Honest to goodness, in Detroit, sometimes you'd put a sheet underneath the tree, and you would fog it just so you could watch the homeowner see, look at what's falling out of that tree. 
bugs, an occasional squirrel, maybe a cat. You know, everything's just dropping out of it. Man, this is great. One of the old guys, the old guys in the 70s, said he remembers in the 30s when you came down with the big sprayer, people would hang their laundry out as a disinfectant. I don't know, maybe he was drunk at the time. But anyway, uh, you know, our attitudes kind of changed a little bit. We're not out there. Anybody here as a kid do what I did as a kid? That's probably why I'm bald today. Anyone remember drive-in movies where you went with your parents and you sat in the back and since all the movies were G, it didn't matter if you were watching along with mom and dad. And before they showed the movie, now this is back in Michigan, mosquito country, They'd run the mosquito fogger right through it. And the fun was, mom, dad, can we chase the mosquito sprayer? Sure, kids, you go out and have a good time. And we'd all be chasing it back and forth. Explains a lot of my behavior too, perhaps. <laughs> I love this out of the Michigan tree surgery manual in 1938. Don't spray any prominent citizens if you can help it they become amazingly annoyed. Now, what you gotta love about that is he highlights, don't spray prominent citizens. In other words, the rest of us, you can roll down the street if you have to, but it's the real important ones you don't want to spray. And this is my own campus. Now, this is 20, 20 years ago, but uh, they were gonna spray the campus green for dandelions they hadn't sprayed it for a couple of years it was a field of gold and a lot of farmers were saying how come you're talking about pesticides and you can't even spray them on your own campus so they got together and they sprayed 2,4-D and a couple of other things and sprayed the lawn and I got a call at 1 a.m to get on campus got on campus a group had put these signs around the entire campus and chalked dead bodies on all the sidewalks and you got to love this. This area has been sprayed with 2,4-D, a substance slightly less carcinogenic than Agent Orange. There's a difference, let me tell you. Uh, Steve Erickson of the physical plant did this and did not tell you. Now, what do you think happened on campus that day? No, not rioting. What the heck? No, people came in and go, you know what? Oh, I feel a little sweaty. Oh, yeah, I think I've got something. I, I got to go home today. Hey, it's a nice day. I ought to spray my lawn. <laughs> And so we had a lot of people just took off for the day, you know, and it wasn't that much. They didn't spray the entire campus, but you know, there's this perception of what's being applied. And by the way, one of the interesting things on pesticide applications is people are very fine with things that they spray and they hire you to spray. It's the neighbors that aren't happy because they're not in control. I'll, I'll bet you've spent more time explaining to neighbors why you're treating than the person who hired you. Because they go, what are you doing over there? What is being done? And so there's a perception. I think it's valid to some degree. I'm not, I'm not dismissing it. But we've got to be careful on that. But we're not doing this much anymore. You know, these old sprayers are kind of fading away. I mean, they're still out there. We still have them in the Black Hills, bark beetles, for example. But this is not the common way we spray urban areas, is it? You're not going to go through neighborhoods much often with something like this. Now, it's almost a good thing. If you take a look at those sprayers, we waste a lot of product. A lot of it doesn't end up where it's supposed to be. Now, some of that is operator error. They're just going out there and fog the world. But when you take a look at some of the studies down there, 41 misses the target, 30 has lost the drift, 4% may hit the target. And we often have that, that people are not spraying properly and, and, we're, and we're getting drift out there and we're not getting the bang that we want. But nevertheless, with mountain pine beetle, this was a fairly common way of treating. Uh, mountain pine beetle was my life for about 20 years uh, when we had that epidemic in South Dakota, which obviously went throughout the entire West uh, as well and is now faded for the most part, thank goodness. But you can see this picture, which was fairly common. And back during the day, we had a lot of companies spraying. In fact, we had people coming to me and saying, John, you've got to spray the entire Black Hills. Oh yeah, I have that. In fact, my favorite call was someone called me and said, John, you need to spray. Sure. Can't you get a bomber out of Ellsworth and do this? Oh yeah, at my finger, I can call a B1. <laughs> All right. 
But no, but you know, individual homeowners were treating trees, but you got to love some of the ways they treated them. Look at this. That's a sprayer. He's going to put a ladder on the tree and walk up and down and spray the whole thing. It didn't work. And then we had a lot of companies spraying. Uh, here's one, and he's out spraying some pines in the, in the fellow's backyard here. And that, and actually was doing a good job. He sprayed it so the trunk was wet, not to drip, so you're wasting chemical. But he did, actually was doing a fairly good job there. But you know, here's the interesting thing. See all those trees? Those trees were all sprayed. If you know anything about mountain pine beetle, they're all hit. They're zombie trees, they're dead. Huh, how come? Well, one of my other jobs is I checked that out. And there was only 56 parts per million of carbaryl on that bark, and there should have been 600. One of the problems we ran into is the price kept dropping. Beginning of the epidemic, it was about $25 a tree. And when it kept going, it got down to six or seven. You can barely buy the chemical to do that for that price because people were just, they got into a, just a feeder market. Everybody just trying to get lower than the next person. So what were companies doing? They were not spraying with the right amount of chemical. And then what happened to that? People were losing trees that were sprayed. So what were people saying? Well, don't spray your trees. You're going to lose them anyway. And the good applicators were taking a hit on that. So we started going out and doing testing and seeing if it was on there. And I'll give you my favorite story. Guy came out, sprayed at a very prominent project, commercial project. And I went up there and the trees were flat out dead. And they had all been hit. And I go, yep. Yeah. I said, well, I said, first of all, what was the pH of your water? Because if you're spraying carbaryl and if it's, of course, too alkaline, that'll break it down very quickly. No, well, pH is good. All right, good. Went through it. And I said, well, you know what? You lost the voices. Well, you know what? It's it's because of those kamikaze beetles. I'm going, kamikaze beetles? He said, yeah, the first one starts to burl into the tree and dies from the pesticide. The second one follows right behind him and shoots through the first one and picks up a little and dies. But usually it's the third or the fourth that manages to get through. Hey, I got any papers on that? I don't think so. I said, you know what? Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to come out and test for that amount of chemical we find out here. He goes, you can do that? Oh, yeah. You can do that all the time. We're going to come out and test the amount of chemical I find on this tree. I said, I can't do it today. I'll, I'll send my assistant tomorrow. Assistant comes back the following day and says, John, I've got the bark samples. Okay, says, I felt really kind of bad about it. I said, why? Well, the applicator met me that morning. Okay, that's fine. And he said, you know what? I really want you to test this tree. I'm really curious about this tree. Oh, okay. Oh, and, and, and do this tree over here too. Oh, you need a third? Yeah, yeah. This one over here I want to know. Okay. So I did all that. And I said, that's fine. Tested the chemical. Went back, met the applicator, met the commercial development owners. I said, you bet. There was 1,500 parts per million on those trees. He goes, I knew it. I said, but what you didn't know is we can measure the breakdown products. And that tree had been sprayed 12 hours before I sampled it. Gotcha. <laughs> All right, for spraying. Oh, my other favorite story. Customer who watching his camera showed the applicator came up, walked around the house, left a hanger in the door and left. Never even sprayed. So that's why I started testing. FYI. If EAB ever gets here, which it will, uh, I do the testing for Sioux Falls, random testing, every applicator, keeps them honest. All the good applicators want me to do that. And that way people are assured that it works because you don't want people saying it doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work because someone did it wrong or tried to cut corners on the cost. And all the good applicators, you bet, test my trees randomly. I don't care, let me know what you got. Um, well, if we are out there spraying, remember, where can it end? It ends up ingestion. No, that's kids, as I mentioned. You can inhale it. you got a lot of surface area in your lungs. And one of our Z requirements, of course, is that you're going to wear respiratory protective equipment. Well, if you're doing that big spraying like that, yeah, you're going to want to be out there wearing a respirator, safety glasses, goggles, or uh, gloves, long sleeve shirt, long pants and that. And he's doing it all right. This is another applicator. 
handkerchiefs do not count as a respirator. All right. Yeah, it's kind of nice. And maybe in COVID times, that looks cool. But nevertheless, you got to be wearing the proper PPE when you're out there spraying. But we've gotten away from this. You know, it's what I used to do a lot back in the 70s. We don't seem to do it much anymore. In fact, nowadays, what we do is injections. And I like that. I'm a fan of that. Let's get the chemical in the tray. Because what we're trying to protect is anything that's attacking the tray. I'm not worried about what's going on in the environment. I don't care who's flying by you. And I want to eliminate exposure for our customers and for all the non-target organisms out there. And yes, indeed, drilling holes in trees can cause problems. But as Shigo said, if it's done properly, we can do this. And what he had also pointed out, sometimes the damaging agent was actually the chemical itself. And so we've got to watch that as well. Now, again, there's bark sprays that can be done, and we do that sometimes as well. And there's other treatments that can be done. But injecting the tree has become a very common means of doing it, and it doesn't arise the concern that our other treatments do. If someone comes home and sees you out there drilling holes in a tree and putting chemical in it, that's not the same as watching you pull up with a big hydraulic sprayer and starting to fog their, their neighbor's entire yard. Well, this has changed the exposure for us. That when you take a look at it, obviously read your chemical out there. It's going to have signal words, caution, and you ought to know what that means if you got a uh, uh, license. And we'll go over that. But essentially, it's going to tell you, and if it's caution, it's a category four. Category four is the least toxic, is the best way to look at it. And a lot of the chemicals that you're using are going to be category four because you're working in urban areas. I've got some great category two chemicals. That's used for agriculture. You're not gonna be using them in somebody's yard. Uh, those can be very toxic, but these mild, they always list the LD50s and all these exceed 5,000, which is good. By the way, we did have some old stuff. I mean, if, for all you young folks, you don't realize how much DDT we used to use. I mean, it was amazing. Look at that. DDT for your uh, cedar closet uh, wallpaper. You bet, 1% chemical in it. Huh, I'll bet we'd sell zillions now. Look at the LD50. It was a category two chemical. It was fairly toxic. It is still fairly toxic. We don't use it much anymore. And one reason is carcinogenic, long-term cancer risk, bioaccumulation, it stays in you, lasts forever, and obviously health effects on wildlife. So there are other things other than just poisoning that we're concerned about. In fact, DDT would not drop you dead the minute you had it. Uh, one of the best studies I ever saw is they fed DDT, and you got to love this, to prisoners in Texas. Yeah, right. Don't go to jail in Texas, apparently. All right. You never know what they're going to do to you. And you know what? I, they all survived it. At least that. Don't know what else happened to them. Don't know where they are 30 years from now. Uh, but nevertheless, there wasn't this acute toxicity where all their inmates dropped dead after eating a bowl of cereal with a little DDT in it. Right, but again, look at the label. And one of the real critical things I want you to look at is here. Applicators and other handlers must wear. And notice what it says, long sleeve shirt, long pants, shoes plus socks. I like that. If they have it on the label, what does that mean? Shell, and it's part of the PPE. And the PPE requirement is what for cleaning? has to be washed separate. What this means is you can't take the clothes you wore that day, jeans and a long shirt, and if you're applying this product, and there's a number of them out there too, and you go home and say, you know what, shirt's pretty good, pants pretty good, I'm just gonna throw it in the wash with everything else. No, you can't. It was put on the label, and that makes it part of PPE. And that means, PPE means you gotta treat it separately. So be kind of cautious on that. Be very cautious on that. Don't do it. And then look at our injections. We don't get a lot of problems anymore with getting anything on us because now we're putting it right into the tree. But there's a couple of problems here. And what you'll see in a lot of pictures, and if you do this, I don't know how many you do, sometimes you can get a little splash off some of these products and that too. Has anyone ever had one pop, pop back at you? Yeah. You don't want to be sitting like that when it pops back at you. You want to be sitting to the side of it. Uh, because while the injections are safer to the public, 
they really present a hazard to the applicators. We can get some splatters on it. Conifers, they're great. Uh, you leave any unit in it more than 12 hours and pull it out, it's going to splatter. Uh, you get bleeders, you know, trees such as birch and that, the spring, they'll splatter. Uh, and almost any tree can, so you got to be kind of careful, but be real careful sitting in front of it as you're pulling them out or putting them in. Uh, and if you take a look now, too, most of your exposure is mixing for you folks here. You're going to say, where are you going to get poisoning? You mixed it. And I've seen people very casually mixing chemicals. Well, you know what? I'm just putting in a tree. No, you got to wear that PPE. So make sure you're wearing all the gloves. Make sure you're wearing everything you need to do for that. Make sure as you're putting everything in, you're wearing the gloves. I've seen people going out there saying, you know, I'm putting the Q system in. I don't need to wear gear up yet. Yes, you do. The PPE requirement. Just pretend everything's toxic and you don't want to touch any of them. And we even have that as a requirement. Now, some systems, not to advertise for them, but the ArborJet folks out there, uh, you know, uh, what we've got there, ArborJet, sorry. Uh, but uh, what they've got out there is with this wedge there, that's Chip Doolittle, or uh, yeah, putting this in there, that you don't even have to mix it and you avoid that contact. So it's kind of a nice system as well. But I want to point out that real critical area, you don't want to get any, any exposure on. You get any genes in that very sensitive zip area, you got to clean those real quick. If you want to get pesticide in you, that's where it's going to go. And a lot of times it's amazing what we get on our clothes and don't even think about it. Well, I'll just leave it and wash it out at the end of the day. No. Some labels that give very specific as to what you have to wear. If they do, follow it. Read and follow label directions. It's our mantra of all us extension folks. I recommend wearing boots for a lot of these products. Not so much you're injecting the tree, that's fine. But if you're injecting into the soil, I mean, that drives me nuts. He's wearing leather, leather shoes and he's putting chemical in the soil. Have you ever seen chemical kind of ooze out of the soil sometimes? Yeah, and you want to be stepping on that in leather? I don't think so, all right? So wearing rubber soles is really good and wearing rubber boots. And there are communities that won't allow you to put anything in the soil. I'm seeing that more and more. A lot of them, they're very, very specific. They want it in the tree. And then read and follow the label directions. And as it says here, wash, keep and wash PPE uh, separately from the laundry. That means clothes. In the context of the label, long sleeve shirts and long pants are considered PPE if they list it on the label as you have to wear it. Now it's PPE, make sure you're cleaning those separately. Don't put them in with everything else that the kids put in. And for heaven's sakes, don't keep overusing gloves. The gloves that are one-time use, throw them out. Don't wear them for the next day or the third day or heaven forbid, keep them and give them to somebody else. Uh, they're gonna get a lot of tear in them, dispose of them and know how to take them off so you don't end up, in fact, any of you that took first aid, the way you remove a glove is the same way you were taught in first aid. So you don't contaminate yourself as you're pulling them out and put them in a biohazard bag, just like you do for first aid. All right, now we'll move over to the plants can kill. Oh yeah, this is a bigger one. Look at this. That's about 3% of all the reportables to us and that lost days. We get lots of them. Uh, on here. And in fact, in the Z, we say, you know what, you're supposed to teach people how to identify. And they specifically list the poison ivies, poison oaks, poison sumacs, because that's the bulk of the reportables. Those are the big ones. And I like this little slide here. Uh, there's Barney. How many grew up with Barney? Yeah, that, that, that sets you back, believe me. All right, you know, Barney's big dinosaur. I love you. You love me. We're all big one happy family. That's not the real world, is it? Kids grew up thinking it's just a friendly world of it. If, if Barney had done this one day, all right, you'd have realized you're going out to a real tough world out there. It's not a Barney-like world. All right, well, the big, I know, sir, some of you, you're scarred for life now. I apologize. I should have warned you. All right, look at her. She said, oh, my God, I've lost everything. But the point on this here is that everything out there is defending itself. I mean, if you watch this movie, the nightlock berries would flat out kill you. Well, there I am down in, everybody knows where that is, Machu Picchu. By the way, who's our, who's our climbers in here? I know there's a few climbers. One of the fun things is climb that little rock behind you. 
that you can get permits for it. It's a scramble, but it is awesome. And once you get up it, it's almost straight down coming down. I mean, it's just like, don't get anyone behind you. But anyway, I'm there and I'm there with my students because I firmly believe you need to take students a lot around the planet. And so I travel a lot with them. And look at Casey there in the center. Why is Casey happy? Well, Casey's smiling. Well, here's why Casey's happy. Ah, coca leaves. Yeah, we chew coca leaves down there. And by the way, don't write the president of the university and say, John's turning his students into drug addicts. No, I'm not. And it's a chew. It's a natural part of the environment down there. A little chew it gives you a mild buzz, kind of like coffee. I don't get students coming back saying, Dr. Ball, I need my coca leaves. But it is kind of nice at high altitude to have a little buzz there, but we forget about it. I mean, it does have that little bit of chemical. In it. And by the way, Drew was our, quote, drug lord. He always carried the bag for us. And I get a kick out of it. He's wearing his D.A.R.E. t-shirt. I mean, there's, there's just was a wrong message there. All right. <laughs> but anyway, we're down there working. That's the death road, which is often fun to drive. But we're working in coca fields. Now we're working in coca fields. I'm not gathering coca. I'm not making students swallow little balloons to come home. All right. But one of the things people forget about is what's the purpose of that alkaloid that we use for a drug, and we shouldn't, in the plant? It's used as a defense. And the interesting thing, it has leopathic properties. It makes a pretty good herbicide. You ever go down there and look at a coca field? You're not weeding it. It really helps kill a lot of things. What it uses to kill everything else, it's using to kill us, right? It wasn't designed to be planted in huge grouping like this. To me, coca is an ecological disaster. I can show you played out coca fields where hillsides are washed away. Because after 30 years, you poison the soil that bad. But we forget that that plants have chemicals in them and those chemicals are used to defend themselves. And a lot of those chemicals we have turned into very important drugs, but they have a purpose. Plants have physical defenses. Those are thorns, for example. They also have chemical defenses. Pines produce the pitch, for example. It costs energy for the plant to do these defenses. What I find fascinating, I tell my students, is back in the 70s in college, they referred to these as secondary plant compounds, and they called them that because they didn't know what they did. They said, why do plants produce them? They don't seem to need them. Yeah, they need them. They need them to defend themselves, but they're very expensive in terms of the food you're manufacturing. So they only produce what they need when they need it, which is a whole other lecture in itself. But again, we've turned a lot of these into drugs, both beneficial and recreational. So let's go over it. When plants go bad, you inhale them. Oh yeah, pines. I always like these questions in the spring. Dr. Ball, there's this dust coming out of my pine trees. Ah, uh, that's just your tree ready to have sex. You know, and that really shocks them. Oh yeah, the kids can be in the yard, don't worry about it. But you know the problems with some of these here, we can get this thing to click, come on. Come on, this doesn't wanna stop. For some reason, it, there we go. If you look at wind pollinated trees, ash, birch, box elder, cottonwood and all that, they do produce an abundance of pollen. It's really not pines this much. We blame pines a lot, but oaks are kind of a bigger one out there. And as you all know here, you can have some plants that do produce a tremendous amount of pollen and do create problems for us. And we've made the problem worse in towns because we plant male cultivars because we don't want seeds. So we got a lot of pollen floating around out there, but you know, cedar fever, uh, when you get those things producing a lot. And of course, mulberry uh, in the spring. Now that's a female one there, the pistolate flowers rather than the staminate. But uh, nevertheless, uh, that's a no plant in many locations as well as I know here. But what about dust from other things? Let's say we cut up the tree. What about if we chip it? Has any of you ever thought what you're breathing in when you're chipping brush? Has anyone ever coughed or that? Yeah, it's kind of like, well, what the heck am I breathing in there if I'm out there chipping? It's not a lot of good stuff, to be honest with you. If you look at coarse particles, the big stuff you're breathing in, uh, two to 10 micron, I mean, that just kind of catches there. That's what you're kind of coughing out. Uh, and you don't want to have to be doing that. But it's also the endotoxins in the wood. You know, it, it, and I bet you know this, it's different wood that you're, that you're chipping causes different reactions and obviously on different people. That it's gonna differ whether the wood is fresh or dry. If you've got monoterpenes, that's greatest with fresh wood. 
the pines and that. You'll get a lot. I mean, you can smell them as you're chipping. And then it's dust with the dry wood. Chip and dry wood, not only is it a pain to chip, uh, but you're breathing in a lot of dust when you're doing that. Now, they, believe it or not, they have standards for it. They recommend only one milligram per meter cubed of air. Five is the European standard. They looked at it. Uh, you'll be happy to know that we really don't end up exceeding the five very often, but you can. And the substances we have the most, the terpenes on the softwoods, uh, the tannins on the hardwoods, along with some of the others. And then you get this problem. Has anyone heard of this or seen this? You stack mulch for too long, and then you rake it, and you get that dust coming off it. It's even got a name, organic dust toxic syndrome. And what that is, is on all those wood chips, when you start raking them up, and you get that dust, coming out of them, you're breathing that in. And what it will do in mild fever, headaches, a little bit of cough, honest to goodness, I mean, I hate to say the word because we, we've used it so often for two years, you're going to feel like you have COVID. And what you've done is you've been chipping. Now, the thing is, as the CDC says, this is self-limiting. You quit chipping, you go home, you clean up, and it gets away. But if you're out there, I recommend, I mean, you're all wearing masks now for a lot of reasons. But wearing one of these masks, actually before uh, the 95s, before COVID, uh, limited them for a while. It's a great thing to be wearing for these. Oh, and then you get this. You got to have some humidity, so it might not be an issue down where you're at here, but I love dog vomit fungus. You put down fresh mulch, and you got a little humidity in the air, this will form on it. People will call me and go, uh, Dr. Ball, there's this stuff on my mulch. Well, what's it look like? Well, I said, oh yeah, it looks like a dog hurled. Yeah, what's it called? Dog vomit fungus, <laughs> all right? And it's a mold. Uh, yeah, if you break it up and cause asthma and some, you know, I say, don't eat it. It'll go away on its own. But yeah, it looks, I mean, I've seen it on new beds on campus. It looked like a fraternity came over and hurled everywhere. <laughs> and then for any of you that like horses, uh, well, you have my sympathies, uh, wood chips or shavings, walnut. You know, on campus, our wood chips do go out to the barns, and any walnut is kept way away, because I can't have any walnut chips being mixed in with the bedding for the horses, so we make flat out clear it doesn't, and that could be a real problem for them. Oh, sycamore. If you, I mean, the one, here's the rule to chip sycamore. Get somebody else to do it, <laughs> all right? Touch up the chainsaw or something. Get out of there. But they've got these little hairs, we call them. Those hairs are defenses. And you're breathing in those little hairs. All right, think of that. Kind of like licking a cat. All right, you're getting all those little hairs in your mouth. Don't, uh, don't ask me where I got that analogy. All right. And wearing a mask is probably a pretty good idea. I don't see it done a lot with chipping. On a hot day, it's kind of hard to do. But I'm just putting it out as a caution. You ever thought the dust coming off a chainsaw? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they got a lot too. And did you ever think what you're inhaling with a chainsaw? Oh yeah, it's not good. In fact, they did a study in LA on workers along highways, the amount of carbon monoxide they were getting into it, and it wasn't coming from the road. It was coming from their chainsaws. You're holding the chainsaw this close. It's mixed fuel. They are really polluters. And hence, if you heard outside, California doesn't like them. Well, they don't like a lot of them. All right. But that's one reason these are going along the wayside. And if it helps you decide anymore, look at this. The benzene in it, that increases your cancer risk one to two in a thousand. Is that a lot? No, but it is. Now, again, you do lots of things that could add to a cancer risk. All right. And then take a look. High in carbohydrates, high in formaldehyde carbon monoxide. And one of the interesting studies that I found showed this. If you're up in the tree and you're making cuts like this all day, you're breathing a lot of carbon monoxide and it's impairing your performance and your thinking. I don't want to overstate it, but it's probably something you never even thought of. Now, of course, one way to get away from that is these. And for those that came out today and watched the steel demonstration, which was awesome, those are my saws. 
They are my go-to sauce. I, they're my climbing sauce. I love them on a college campus. I took down a spruce next to the library. I didn't have the librarian come out and shush me. They're that quiet. I love them. But somebody asked the question out there, and he gave the answer that I didn't like. If someone said, well, how long do the batteries last? Oh, you know, three or four hours. I go, no, that's bullshit. All right. <laughs> Sorry about my language. But I even asked him after I said, three or four hours. I said, is that trigger time? No. And, and again, he wasn't trying to lie or that. He was answering the question. And it's correct. If you're just picking it up and using it for a bit and picking it up and using it for a bit, it'll last that long. But being the science guy, we had to do a study. And we looked at trigger time, how long you can run the trigger. And we did that by using different diameter branches. And we just made cuts, cuts, cuts. And we measured the time, the time your finger was on the trigger. And so we'd make a cut, make a cut, make a cut, make a cut. And it didn't matter whether I was cutting three inch wood or 12 inch wood, obviously. Okay, 12 inch took longer, so you could make fewer and three inch a lot longer, but it still came out on that little Husky 200, seven minutes. That's how much battery time you had, seven minutes. On their 315 minutes, Think of that for trigger time. Now, by the way, the nice thing with the electric chainsaws, the minute you improve battery technology, you've improved the saw. And these batteries that we were using, this is our study we did two years ago. So they've improved the battery since then too. But I will have to give a nod to uh, steel out there. I can get 18 minutes off that one. And 18 minutes I like, does anyone know why? That's the length of a small top handled gas saw. We did trigger time on those too. So a little steel he had out there, it's same as a gas saw. I'm gonna get about 16, 18 minutes. And that's about as good as it gets and I'm fine with that. They're bigger saws, I can get a little bit more because it's a bigger battery set. But I love the electrics as a climbing saw. A lot of people in buckets don't like them because they're operating them too quick. But when you look at the amount of time you spend climbing versus cutting, these are excellent tools. I will give you two notes of caution and then we'll go back to this because I could spend an hour just on this. Two notes of caution. One note of caution is they're quiet. That's a problem. Heard it from others too. That the sound they make, you have to wear hearing protection because they are just above the decibel level, but at 25 feet, the decibel level is about the sound of a large, of a conver loud conversation. So here's the problem. You all know command and response. Headache, okay, okay, nobody comes in. Unfortunately, I had a few guys that were also used to, when they heard that, oh, I left a branch in there. I didn't hear John saw rev up so I can run in and grab it. I almost killed a guy because it was an electric saw. He didn't hear it. And so nowadays, command and response is command and response. Don't wait to listen to something. The other problem, I'm used to when my finger's off the trigger, it's not making noise anymore. It's shut off. Okay, that would be gas, right? If I hit the if I hit the chamber, I get going blah, 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 blah. With these, you take your finger off the trigger, it's still on. And we've had incidences where someone clips it back onto their harness, it's on, they're climbing and they catch that and it runs into their leg. And that, not a lot, but I've gotten in a habit, and, and, and there's not a requirement, I got in a habit, I just shut it off. I don't hit the chain break, I just shut it off. And I've just got myself to say, shut off the sawage time. Oh, and then the very last comment. <laughs> you wanna know what a bad day is? A bad day is when you go in the shop in the morning and you find nobody plugged in any of the batteries the night before. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You can't go out and mix a battery. Okay, now we're gonna wait for 45 minutes to charge them. All right, so get them charged. The other thing too, I wanna remind you, Every time your feet leave the ground, you shall have a handsaw. Every time the aerial lift lifts off the cradle, there shall be a handsaw in there. That's a requirement. Every time your feet leave the ground and you're climbing, there shall be a handsaw with you. That is a requirement. And it's one of the most common violations. That you can get a lot of scabbards now that they got a place for your handsaw and your chainsaw. Make sure you have them, make sure you have handsaws. For some of you that say, hey, I make money in the winter stringing Christmas lights out of the aerial lift. No, you don't have to have a handsaw then. It's during arbor cultural operations, not stringing Christmas lights, painting a flagpole or anything like that. 
But I'm not kidding you. Make sure you have a handsaw with you. And they're good tools to have too, by the way. Well, how else when plants go bad? Oh, you touch them. Oh, anyone know what that is? Yeah, honey locusts. Oh, my God. As a kid, we used to break those off, time on the long dowels, and we'd throw them at my sister's Barbie sets because they were all cardboard. It was awesome. All right. But yeah, these are wicked. And why do they have that many thorns? Anyone know? Yeah, because they're tasty. Anyone ever eat any of these? They're sweet, kind of like a Snickers bar. Not that I'm recommending you go out and eat the darn things. But if you're that sweet, you're guarding them. I'm going to put these thorns here so nobody else gets my sweet ones. And somebody had it right. I heard it. You know, what ate them? It's long since gone. It died out. You know, why did we lose all that megaphor? Well, we don't know. Climate change, perhaps. Part of it seems to indicate that. Yeah, maybe a little bit of overhunting. But we lost them. Think of that. Honey locust, coffee tree right here, Osage orange, plants that produce fruit that they're defending in some ways. And what ate the fruit has long since died out. In fact, interesting enough, Ontario is considering that Kentucky coffee tree may go extinct in the wild, not in town, of course. And you might say, how'd they figure that out? You know, take a look at the, at the ones in the permafrost and things like that. And they were able to figure out, yeah, that's a big one. And, and they talked to old guys like me and Gary that said, oh yeah, I remember watching them eat that stuff, yeah. <laughs> now, by the way, the thornless ones, they're not as sweet. Makes sense, right? You don't have to defend anything. All right, that's what you got to watch is the thorns and any of these thorns. Anytime something sticks in you, punctures you, okay, that's a good way to get bacteria. You can get infected. Mom told you best, wash it. Soap and water right away. Every year we get infections because someone end, ends up getting stuck with some sort of thorn. Uh, we can end up with a lot of inflammations on these. I don't know if you ever use these, but I love those gloves. If I'm out there cutting something with some thorns to it, I want something that's a little bit more rock hard down there and isn't going to end up cutting me. So these thorn armor gloves are just, just the, and I don't get any money from them, but I love it. And then poison ivy. That's the big one. Poison ivy, poison oak, uh, poison everything. And guess what? On those, we're supposed to tell people how to identify it if it's in your area. That is one of the requirements. And poison ivy is considered the morning after problem because the minute you contact the plant, you don't show symptoms. You don't present. So we say, oh yeah, I'm not, I'm not allergic to it. Look at me, I'm walking in it. Look at me, I'm gonna roll in it. And then tomorrow they're just completely blocked out of it. Uh, symptoms don't occur until about 12 to 48 hours afterwards. Obviously with this, you wanna treat it. Now, some of you might say, well, I'm not allergic to it. No, every time you have contact with it, some of that breaks down. So it's not a case of you'll never get it. It's a question of how long you live versus when you're finally going to have it break down. Some of you, you might be my age, and I still don't get it. Uh, but other people, you know, I, I didn't get it before when I was younger. Now I'm in my 40s, and I do. Well, that's it. Every time you expose yourself to it. So what does that mean? Don't expose yourself to it. Wash the clothes, wash the boots. You all know that. It's not a myth. Those oils can stay on a boot for a long, long time. Okay, you're out in the field. What do you do when you, you, you walk through and you say, oh my gosh, I'm in poison ivy. What do you do? So it's on my hands. Oh my God, what do I do? No, he said soap and water. Wipe it, I heard. Neither of those are fun. No, this is why you carry your emergency beer. <laughs> All right, <laughs> you take the beer and pour it. All right, now for people watching at home, don't do this. It will work, but don't do this. Uh, the reason is it's alcohol, all right? And isopropyl alcohol, you need something to break down the oils. And that works out the best. Now, if you're using, if you're at a picnic table and all you got is beer, that's fine, but grab your neighbor's beer. Your beer is too valuable. And, and, and grab a cheap beer, all right? I mean, you just need the alcohol in it, but that'll break it down. And don't do like this guy's doing. He must be a college student. <laughs> but yeah, you get the poison sumax, of course, and a number of the others. And ginkgo, I, you know, I, sh I apologize. I don't know Albuquerque as well as I should. Do you have ginkgos down here? Okay, you do? Those are a disaster. 
I mean, they really are. Uh, the fruit, if you pick up the fruit, you're going to break out like poison ivy. Now, first of all, the fruit reeks. All right. What's that? Because you got to get rid of the stuff because it reeks. I mean, it smells like, yeah, it smells like dog poop gone bad. I mean, literally, you want to rake it up. Now, why don't we have a lot of the fruit around? Because we plant males. I heard my last presenter talk about that. Going to give you a bit of advice, which is in my book, which doesn't apply to, the book isn't for this area, so I'm not pushing the sale. Male means male today. It does not mean male tomorrow. Yes, seriously. In fact, if you read the book, The Ginkgos, they're now showing ginkgos that be verting sex. They have ginkgos that they know, for example, one for 270 years was a guy. And then one year he decided to be a gal and started producing fruit. And the next year went back to being a guy. And then part of them went to being a girl. And we're seeing that happening. And I've seen cultivars that release, this will not produce fruit. And it does. Basic drive of nature is to reproduce. You try to block that by saying, we're just going to go to males. They're going to overcome it. So I'm not saying don't go with males, but don't depend on males. And I get really frightened when people say, well, we're going to introduce this invasive plant, but it'll be okay because we're just going to plant males. Male today. <laughs> Oh, the leaves too aren't very good. If you chip those up, seriously, not like you have a lot of big gingos to chip like we did out east, you can break out like poison ivy. All right, plants go bad, you eat them. I, I love this, an extension. I have a lot of starving people in South Dakota. I get asked all the time, can I eat this? Can I eat this? Can I eat this? Send me pictures, text messages. And, and what's the answer when they say, can I eat this? Well, it's always yes, of course you can. It just might kill you, all right? So ask the right question. Will this harm me if I eat it? But, you know, I get these buckeyes and people say, well, can I eat them? I said, no, there's an alkaloid in there that'll kill you. Well, I see the squirrels eating them. You're not a squirrel. Don't take your dietary habits from small rodents, you know? Uh, I mean, my gosh, the seeds are poisonous. The, I mean, yeah, you could roast them. You're going to do that. And, of course, leaves for horses. The red uh, maple and the box elder leaves, highly toxic to horses when they dry in the fall. Uh, they found that's one of the real problems. In the fall, if you've got your pasture down to nothing, when those, when those box elder leaves start to drop, they'll start eating a lot of them more than they should. And that can cause problems with them. <laughs> Common buckthorn, I saw it was in an inventory here. Is anyone familiar with that plant? Not as big of a problem as it is here at home. That's a problem, common buckthorn. The Ramnus cathartica, cathartica, cathartica. Scientific names always mean something. Cathartic, purging. Oh, yeah, look at the fruit. Looks a lot like a choke cherry. So I get students around in the woods, and this little invasive plant's going everywhere, common buckthorn. I remember telling students, oh, look, choke cherries. Don't eat them. Don't eat them. All right. If you eat them, it'll result in sudden and violent diarrhea sudden and violent. Oh, the other word they use, explosive. <laughs> All things you want to hear before you load a bunch of students into the van for the hour ride back from the woods. All right. Well, guess what? You only have to eat about eight ripe berries. All right. So we're out in the woods on a Friday. Told the students don't eat those berries. What do you think two of them did? No, they didn't eat them. They're not that stupid. They picked them. And Saturday morning made blueberry pancakes for their roommate. Now, don't do this seriously, but they did. The roommate ate about half a pancake and said, I just had this funny feeling. Started to stand up, and that's where he, far as he got. The kitchen was collateral damage. <laughs> oh, one of the worst? I get a call, and I don't like these calls. I got a call from Washington State. Somebody had read my pest update and for some reason called me rather than local poison control. Our kids just ate these berries. You're calling me from that far away? I, do you have a picture? Yes, I'll send you the picture and the leaves. And I looked, and it's something I could ID from that. I said, that's buckthorn. You know what? How many berries did the kid eat? 
And then in the background, I heard the husband going, honey. Oh, yeah, I know what happened. By the way, you purge them out. You're not going to poison yourself with them. It runs through you that quick. Oh, how about these? Yeah, fungus. I get a lot of hungry people in South Dakota. Can I eat these? Sure you can. Just don't. By the way, despite the fact you need a lot of fungi, you know the rule there. Don't eat anything. You haven't had somebody that's an expert stand there and say, yes, that's it. Here's how you identify. Oh, Morel. Love them. Okay, very last one as we're getting down to the last five or so minutes. And that's drug poisoning. And you'll notice that's a little bit of it, but I want you to look at the number, about 5% of drug overdoses in five years in Massachusetts. We're among landscape and tree care workers. All right, 57% were opioid related. And I want you to notice the next word, after work injury. Not too surprising, we are above the average in opioid overdoses. And it's not what people think. They think, okay, it's some young kid doing something stupid. No, it's an old person that spent 40 years in this profession and has been pretty busted up and takes pain medication and gets hooked on it. And seriously, that's the problem. I'm not so much worried about the young folks. I'm worried about everybody, but the young folks, I'm worried about people actually a little younger than me even. because this occupation can bust you up. If you take a look at all our climbing, how that's changed. You know, these techniques we used to do, some still do. That's a lot of work. You body thrust up a tree. You double line foot like, like we said, without any, any uh, uh, anchor to you. I mean, that's a lot of work. You spike up a tree. That's a workout. It's hard on your body. You do it every day. You know, or you're doing this. How many are overreach on an aerial lift? How many cut, cut something and hold it at the same time and pitch it? How many pick up a log and probably... You can do that, but you do that for 20, 30, 40 years, you're going to be some serious hurt. You're going to find they've replaced things. You're going to find they're going to put you in some pain medication. And after that pain medication goes out, you know what happens? You're going to try to get some more. And you're not only going to kill yourself or injure yourself, you're going to kill other people. You know what? This happens. You're driving down the road. We had one. He just borrowed the pain medication from his buddy and only had that and two beers at lunch. Got in the company truck, hauling the chipper, drove down the road, T-boned a van, killed four people. Okay, Drug is a problem here. And the problem is with us older folks. And the only thing I can caution you there is watch the medications they give you. All right? Just don't get over-medicated. And for all you young people, don't bust your body up like we did. Uh, we've got a lot more technology that will help you do the job safer. Well, my last one. I hate to say it. But now in first aid, we have to teach how to use Narcan. It's become that much of a problem. So I'm going to spend just a minute on symptoms. All these are opioids are depressants. They're going to slow your body down till it stops. And one of the symptoms is pinpoint eyes. All right, doesn't matter the light, they're pinpointed like that. Uh, and somebody's just kind of, they're not breathing very well, and they're slowing it down and that, that's bad. And so fentanyl, which of course is the real drug of choice here, it seems to be, those are the ones where you're going to get, get the constrictions to it. You'll get others where they're dilated or blowing out, and we don't have time to talk about them all. But that's what you can use, and that's what they sell. That's what you can buy. And how you do these? Pinpoint eyes, you give this by a nasal spray or auto injection. If they're responsive, you give it to them right away. If they're not responsive, you might have to start CPR. I mean, if they're not responsive, they're everything slowing down. You may need to use the AED. Uh, and then you're going to provide them with the drug as well. Note, you give the nasal spray, wait three minutes, repeat if no change in condition. Doesn't work long, but hopefully somebody's called 911 as well. Let me give you a little bit of advice too. The auto injector is more of an issue, but what I like is if you can put them on an IV, you can really meter what's going into them because the best thing you can do is bring them out of them, but don't wake them up because they can come back as a real mean drunk. Think of it as suddenly you're going to go through a big withdrawal and you're going to swing. So if you're helping somebody with this, don't make sure, make sure you don't have the wall behind you and they boxed you in. Seriously and they go through first aid, it's a lifesaver, really is. And I hate to think we gotta be talking about this more now. But the other reason we need to talk about this more is guess what? One of the fastest growing age classes of tree workers is the over 45. 
seriously because we can't get young people into this job anymore. All right, look around here. All right, most of you are younger than me, but it's not like we got a lot of 22 year olds. And I'll tell you, my students that are graduating, they got more job offers than they know what to do with, which was a big difference from 1970. And that, so take care of yourselves, everybody. With that, I'll finish on time. Well, you got a nice long break, and then you got Gary to keep you awake. And I will take questions up here for people who want to chat. So the rest, you can go out there, use your bathroom break and eat. There's my email, my phone number. I'm like everybody else. I check Texas continually. Thank you, people.